Greetings, fellow truth seekers. Welcome to Paranormal M, where we uncover the secrets of the supernatural. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. Even drop a comment, that'd be cool. And stay updated with our latest investigations. We hope you're ready to uncover the truth behind the mysteries. I think my apartment is haunted, and I don't know what to do. So I moved into this apartment about six or seven years ago. The first few months we lived here, we saw and experienced weird things. About two summers ago, I was in my upstairs living room in my bedroom. I had my AirPods in. I started to hear tapping on my window, so I took my AirPods out and I heard stuff hitting the window like little pebbles. But I live on the third floor, so it doesn't really make sense on how somebody could throw stuff at my window. I didn't really care, so I just put my AirPods back in and then I felt something running up the stairs. I took my AirPods out again and I could hear somebody definitely running up the stairs and I assumed it was my brother and my mom. I was just waiting for somebody to pop out and there was nobody a few minutes later. While my AirPods were back in my ears, I heard somebody whisper in my ear. And when I turned around, nobody was there. Hmm. Another thing that happened was late one night, it was like with two or three in the morning, I think. I walked out of my mom's room because I had fallen asleep in there in an accident. I had to go to the bathroom. And as I was walking to the bathroom, I felt like somebody was watching me from the stairs. And when I came out of the bathroom, my cat was staring at the stairs. I got curious one day and decided to look up my address on Google and I found out that my apartment was one of the first places built in my town. It used to be like a gas station or something like that. Freaked me out really bad because ever since I moved here when I was really young, creepy things have just been happening to me and my family. I forgot to put in that after I heard all the stuff upstairs with somebody whispering in my ear, I was creeped out to stay up there. So I would just stay in my little brother's room. And my other brother ran into the room in the middle of the night and said the boogeyman was on the stairs. I thought it was really weird coming from him because he's not the type to say anything like that. And he thinks he's like this big, bad, tough little boy. So when he's scared, he doesn't want you to know, so he tries to play it off. But he was like crying and freaking out and scared me so bad. Vacation Mexico Haunting Story Possible Poltergeist I have a few stories from Mexico. I don't know if it's something about Mexico, but those few times it only happened in Mexico. Maybe you guys can debunk this. Call it fake if you want. There's nothing I can prove, so I don't care. I'm 50-50 on the supernatural stuff. I'd like to try to think I can debunk it but I'm a Mexican-American who frequently travels to Mexico. And one time when I was 15, I flew with my parents and sister to Cancun to stay for nine days. We had rewards with this resort, so they upgraded us to a suite the size of a luxury apartment. Didn't listen to the receptionist. Not sure if they did a deal for like half points of the rewards or something. I'm 21 now and still don't know how that works. Three bedrooms, a living room, and two bathrooms, and a kitchen and a kitchen table. I'm stating this to let you guys know that the place is huge and the rooms are spread apart. And these details will matter later, possibly. I sleep with the door closed, and every night in my bedroom I heard like bare footsteps just pacing back and forth like you can... Well, not sure how to explain that, but if you know the sound, then you know. In the hallway outside my door, it sounded eerie and tried to try to reason it as like the built-in AC or something to sleep. Five nights in, I wake up to pee late at night. Not sure what time. I pee in the bathroom, walk out, and the door behind me shuts as hard as possible. It was loud. My parents that slept on the other side of the suite even heard it. I jumped, ran as fast as I could to my parents' bedroom. My parents woke up on high alert, and because we both thought something broke in and they heard the door shut, they thought it was like the entrance door, not my bathroom door, until I told them. 
so they thought somebody was already hiding in our suite. My dad grabs an umbrella and runs and tells my sister to get in there. Maybe there's an intruder, or both. I don't know. My sister comes running to her parents' bedroom. My mom's on the phone with the front desk to get security, and my dad's plan was to sort of turn on the suite's lights one by one. He started with the hallway and then the kitchen. By chance, they both turn off by themselves. My dad runs back as fast as he could back to the bedroom with us. He locks the door behind him and told us to wait for security. He tells us to be quiet so we can hear the front door open and close to hear the intruder. Security front desk come. They have a MasterCard, so when they arrive, they open the door themselves and shouted, show yourself. Then my dad shouted where the guests in the master bedroom check everywhere else. And mind you, I'm crying with my sister and my, and my mom, really, and just trying to stay calm. They said it was clear, even though we didn't hear anyone leave. They checked everywhere, kitchen cabinets, closets, bathrooms. We didn't hear anyone leave. None of the sweet cases were opened or even touched. My dad then spoke to them and I realized none of them were, well, none of them were police. It was like hotel employees, like security or front desk. They only had flashlights. They brushed it off, said call again if anything happens. They'll have a security guard in our hallway apparently for the night. Makes you think this probably happened before and they felt like they didn't need to bring in the police. We felt uneasy that night, so we all slept in my parents' bed. The nights after that, nothing happened and we all slept with our doors locked, and the barefoot steps outside my hallway door stopped. Freaky shit. My grandpa, who's retired and works for a hotel in Cali, told us people commit suicide in hotels all the time. Did someone off themselves in that suite? I would never know, but freaked me out. Would this be a ghost or a poltergeist? Was it something else more demonic? Choking in sleep slash presence. I had this experience last night. I went to be around 2 a.m. and I woke up something during the night to sound of somebody walking. Watch out, guys. I felt like someone was there, walking in my room, so I closed my eyes again. It felt like there was a presence there trying to lift the covers from near my face. I was too scared to open my eyes. I could only do so after it felt like they were walking away. I saw nothing in the dark. A few moments later, I felt that same feeling of someone walking toward me. So, I closed my eyes again. This time, not only did I feel the same presence try to peel my covers back, but they applied pressure on the left side of my throat. Now I sleep with my head tilted to the right so I don't know if they were trying to suffocate me or check for a pulse. It didn't feel strong enough to choke me. I could have moved after they left the second time for a minute. Then I pushed myself far from the edge of the bed. The bed is in the corner, in parentheses. Is a demon attached to me? I want to start by saying that I'm like a 20-year-old female. I've always struggled with a bit of anxiety and depression, but... It's to be expected because of some unfortunate life circumstances. Though it's not debilitating and I'm still able to live a happy life without it affecting me too much, my physical health isn't perfect either. I wouldn't say that I'm unhealthy though. I don't smoke weed and I rarely drink and I don't do any other drugs so I've never been diagnosed with any serious mental illness besides the depression and anxiety. I also have a sleep disorder that causes hypnopompic hallucinations. Hallucinations that occur during the transition from sleep to wakefulness. And hypnagogic hallucinations. Hallucinations that occur during the transition from wakefulness to sleep. I also have gotten sleep paralysis, though I 
don't really get it much anymore. My hallucinations mostly consist of shadow figures, hands and gripping onto walls or coming from underneath doors, distorted faces, pulsing objects and floating objects. I have also experienced some auditory hallucinations like breathing next to my ear and indescribable whispering. I've had this sleep disorder for about 10 years now, so I've gotten pretty used to it, but definitely it's gotten worse lately. No, I'm not necessarily religious, but I am agnostic, and I've always believed in demons and ghosts due to experiences I had in one of my old houses. This house was where hallucinations started, too. Lately, I've been hallucinating six or seven times a night during different periods of the night. Normally, I'd just be able to ignore them and fall back asleep. But these ones felt particularly malicious, even taunting like something's purposely trying to scare me. I won't go super into detail about each and every hallucination I've had recently, but I will go into detail about last night's. That's because I had hallucinations that I've never had before. I got in bed around 1am last night and attempted to fall asleep. As soon as I shut my eyes, I started to feel anxious even though I was in a good mood right before going to bed. I felt like there was a presence of something but I ignored it as usual because I felt like I was just overthinking. Some time went by until I started to fall asleep. Before I could fully fall asleep, my eyes opened extremely quickly and wide. My heart started racing. I felt like I couldn't breathe for a while, like there was a pressure pushing down on my chest. And no, this was not sleep paralysis. I could move and I know the difference. I looked around my room and noticed that everything had a slight tinge of red. Not super intense, but enough to notice a difference, and definitely know that I was not hallucinating. Calm myself down for a few minutes before I'm able to really sleep, but the same thing happens again. I'm startled awake with a racing heartbeat and everything looks red, except this time the red is much more vibrant happens about six or seven times throughout the course of an hour, maybe two, and each time the red becomes more and more vibrant until it looks like I'm looking through red-tinted sunglasses. I forgot to mention this, but I sleep with the light on. Not super bright, but bright enough to see everything in my room. I've slept with the light on since I started hallucinating, too. Couldn't take it anymore and I ended up sleeping in the living room just because I was so scared and I was getting no sleep. It stopped once I moved onto the couch. I find this hallucination weird because it was way more scary than figures and faces I've seen in the past. Even though it was just a red tint, it felt extremely malicious. Now, to this morning, I woke up feeling like I had drank a whole bottle of vodka to myself. Having to rush to the bathroom because I thought I was going to throw up. And I'm not pregnant, by the way. Me neither. I didn't throw up, but I did end up sitting next to the toilet for a while. I'm feeling a bit better now, but I also have this intense pressure in my head and neck. It's not a headache, but it feels like someone's squeezing my skull. Wish I could explain the situation in more detail, but this has already turned into a full-blown essay, so I guess I'll settle. Anyways, does anybody know if this is demonic? I would normally just write it off as a weird hallucination, but the nausea and head pressure is weirding me out. If you have any comments or questions, that would be great. I saw my uncle after he died. So when I was about four or five years old, I woke up in the middle of the night while sleeping in my parents' room. At the foot of the bed, I saw this man who I didn't know walk into the room and look around at everybody who was in the room. He looked kind of transparent, and I could still see the color of his clothes and even his skin tone. After a few seconds of him looking around, he just turned around and walked into the closet. I got up and tried to follow him, but he was just gone. A week or so later, my family went to a funeral, and only then did I recognize the man. 
didn't tell any of my family until years later. They only sort of believed me because of the recent event with my other uncle. So anyways, fast forward to last Tuesday. I had just gotten off the closing shift at my job. Me and my brother who share a room with our uncle just kind of chilling the rest of the night. And our uncle had been out for the whole day, basically. So we didn't know when he was coming home and, well, finally I saw him walk inside from the back patio as he closed the sliding door and locked it. I only knew it was him because of the tattoos on him and the white tank top he would always wear. The rest of the night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. My uncle would walk around the room and the house and I even remember seeing him walk into the kitchen to grab something to eat. Finally, I was getting ready to sleep at around 2.30. I remember looking around the room and seeing my uncle lay in his bed. I also remember looking at my brother on his iPad with max brightness and thinking to myself, he should turn down the brightness or he'll bother his uncle. It wasn't until the next morning when I got woken up with a knock at my door. It was the detectives and my uncle's parole officer. They spoke with my grandma and told her my uncle was in the hospital. I didn't think too much of it because he had went to the hospital a week prior for stomach issues. An hour later, I got a call from my sister crying, saying my uncle had been hit by a car and was brain dead. For the rest of the day, I thought that this, well, had to have happened sometime after 3 in the morning. Later that night, we found out that it had happened around 9.30 while I was at work and before I even got home. I saw a ghost in my apartment in college. I've never really had any experiences with the paranormal and didn't believe in ghosts or spirits. I still don't even though I saw a ghost. In 2013, I, a 23-year-old male, was in my two-bedroom apartment. My roommate went home for the weekend for work, so I had placed myself pretty much. I picked up and ignorant amount of wings from Pizza Hut around 6 p.m. While I was gorging on food on my couch just watching Sons of Anarchy while I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye from my roommate's room. I looked down the hall and stared for a minute. After not seeing any movement, I just assumed that I was mistaken. Later that evening, after a hard league of legends sesh grinding with the boys, I logged off around 1 or 2 a.m. to go to bed. My bedroom lights are on, and I was setting up, you know, just to go to sleep. I put a fan up, and I was facing my bedroom door, and that's when I saw a white translucent figure move from my roommate's room into the bathroom, two feet from my door and six feet from me. I was looking down at my fan when the figure moved in front of my door, so I didn't look directly at it, but it was close enough for me to get a decent idea of the size and color of my peripherals. Someone was in my house. Instinct kinked in, and I just went charging to the bathroom with my box fan ready to fuck some burglars up and, well, nothing. Spent the next 30 minutes thinking about what I saw. Then I went to sleep. Didn't see anything else like that the rest of the lease term, but had a couple of weird, really vivid dreams, and I never dream. The figure I briefly saw looked feminine and was shorter, like maybe five foot four, five foot six, white and translucent. Clothes seemed like a wedding dress, or just a dress. Trying to find a mysterious Instagram reel. Hello. Two days ago, I stumbled across an Instagram reel that really freaked me out. Unfortunately, because I didn't interact with it in any way, I have no way of finding it again. It doesn't help that I don't remember any of the tags or the account name. So I'm posting here as a last resort. And getting picked up by Paranormal M now, apparently. Because I really want to see this thing again. And here's the description. It's as follows. The reel itself is an interior home monitoring security footage of a living room. 
There's two visible entryways, a set of double doors on the back wall leading to what's most likely a kitchen, and a single door on the right wall most likely opening to a bedroom or a bathroom. I want to say it's an Asian country because of the wooden doors on the back wall, but anyway, there's a younger, maybe middle-aged mom on the couch watching TV with her overweight kid's son. I guess it's middle school, maybe. They're minding their own business until suddenly... A bizarre, low-to-the-ground black entity with a white face, I believe, pops out around the left double door. Only its face, torso, and arm are visible. Additionally, there may be another spirit present in the single entrance door, but it's so blurry that you can't tell for sure. Both the mom and kid see the black figure, but they have completely different reactions. The mom, maybe used to this, ignores it. The son naturally flips out and screams. I don't remember if there are any subtitles or if you can hear what she says, but I feel like she tells him to just ignore it. The kid tries to, but ultimately panics again, begins to cry, and in response, the mom gets up, approaches the entity, and calmly shuts both double doors. She is able to calmly return to her seat, but just before they get comfortable again, you can actually see and hear quite audibly. The entity's hands start banging on the glass on the left double door, either trying to get in or just grab their attention. And as quick as it started, the video ends. I have not seen that. Anyone else? Joseph Plunkett's cell and kill Mainham Gale during 2014, I had the opportunity to travel to Dublin and London for a few weeks. My husband was there for work and I was tagging along. I spent every day exploring on my own. And on my last way in Dublin, I visited... Something that I can't pronounce. I'm sorry. Kilmainham Gale. It was a bleak place. During the tour, I was roughly in the middle of the group. I'm short... And I was curious what the cells looked like because the doors were all closed. I rushed ahead after some stairs, chose a cell, and held my Nikon cool picks up to the little window and snapped a quick shot before catching back up to my spot in line. This may sound silly, but that particular cell along that row felt like there was a heavier weight to it. There was no airflow within the cells, which are always kept closed. I didn't have a flash turned on. I only looked at the photos a few weeks later when we were back home. No other images either within the jail or throughout the trip looked unusual. I do wonder if the beam of light from the small window may have simply caught some dust in a way that I have personally never seen. But then again, those who work at the jail report odd occurrences attributing it to restless spirits. The tour guy said once the entire group was standing together that the cell I had kind of quickly photographed had just been Joseph Plunkett's cell, and that he was granted only a few brief minutes with the love of his life to profess their love for one another and say goodbye within the cell. That was immediately before facing a firing squad in Stonebreaker's yard. The folks at Kilmanham Gold treated the cell with reverence, and I was glad that I'd been drawn to that one in particular. Some background. Notorious for a multitude of reasons, this place imprisoned and executed leaders of the Easter Rising. The Easter Rising was an Irish Republican insurrection against the British government in Ireland. It began in Dublin on April 24, 1916, which was Easter Monday. The insurrection was planned by Patrick Pierce, Tom Clark, Joseph Plunkett, and other leaders of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Lasting for six days, the rebellion was quickly suppressed by the British Army and was a seminal moment in modern Irish history, helping pave the way to the nation's independence in 1922. One of the leaders, Joseph Plunkett, the youngest of the rebel leaders to be executed, was wholeheartedly in love with Grace Gifford, a woman who was also passionate about Irish independence. She was an artist and cartoonist, while Plunkett was a poet and editor for the Irish Review. Against the wishes of her parents, 
Grace became engaged with Joseph Plunkett in December 1915. When Plunkett was imprisoned, awaiting his execution by firing squad, he was granted his request that a priest marry him and Grace in the prison chapel. On the night of May 3, 1916, just hours before he was to be executed, she was brought to the jail. In 1949, she recalled that evening, she said as follows, When I saw him, so unselfish. He never thought of himself. He was not frightened, not in the slightest. Before facing the firing squad, he said, I'm very happy I'm dying for the glory of God and the honor of Ireland. In his will, Joseph left everything to his widow, but his parents refused to honor it. Grace remained resolutely nationalist even after her husband's death and was imprisoned in Kilmingham Gold for three months in 1923. She never remarried and outlived her husband by 39 years. Grace Gifford died on December 13, 1955, and was buried with the full military honors at Glasnevin Cemetery. I got locked out while alone at home and had to jump down the balcony. Hey. I'm a 23-year-old female. Something very strange happened to me where I had to jump down a balcony. When I was under 18, my brothers who were adults living at home got into fights. And the social services decided it wasn't a good environment for me. Placed me with my mom in an apartment two hours away. My mom started working in a new city very fast. And most nights wouldn't be home until morning. The apartment that we were placed in was just very weird. You kind of felt a heaviness when you walked in. I was a smoker back then, so like usual I went to the balcony to smoke our balcony door and had like a handle inside. There was no handles on the outside. The door overall was old and heavy and you had to push pretty hard before pulling down the handle to lock it. I was done smoking, I turned around, pushed the door with no handles outside, but the door was locked. I thought that was so weird, so I looked down the balcony and the ground wasn't so far away. We were on the first floor and there was a space of maybe one and a half meters from where the balcony ended to the ground. I proceeded to jump down the balcony and then when the side of the building was there, there was like a door that led to the basement and shared a laundry room. And that was always open. Went in the door and up to my apartment. Got in, walked to the balcony door while looking from inside. The handle was pulled. The handle was hard, period. It's impossible. It had turned on its own, period. I was weirded out. I just thought, okay, weird, and went on with my day. Many other things happened there, but at the time I was cold, emotionless, and depressed. So I didn't care much. Now that I think back, I can't believe I lived there and wasn't scared. Two other things that would happen frequently was at night when I was sleeping, my blanket would get pulled from one corner to underneath my bed. It would get pulled from a specific place and I could feel it on my body when I got up to turn around the lighter. I'd look at the blanket and it had scrunches on that side like it was being pulled as if somebody put their hand on it and pulled it. The other thing was food going missing. I felt food would go missing from my plate when I went to the bathroom and so on. I felt it, but wasn't sure, so I started really looking at my food and memorizing how it looked and count how many pieces of meat was on my plate while looking normal and unbothered. Food went missing from my plate, especially meat, or I noticed meat more clearly. Vivid dream about my late mom shortly after her passing. So I know a lot of times dreams about people we miss or have lost can happen, but this one felt very different somehow. Extremely real even, like it was actually happening. 
So my mom passed away around 10 days before this dream happened. In the dream, I was at a party which was being held in the hall of a restaurant that my mom and I really liked, but hadn't eaten at or talked about for years prior. She was sitting in a booth dressed nicely, but not super fancy or anything, and just enjoyed a drink and smiling. I ran over, pushing past people in my way, some of the people I knew, some I didn't. That was just so I could get to her. When I did get to her, she smiled and said, Hello, princess. She always called me that. I started sobbing. I could feel my eyes stinging and everything. I sat next to her and begged her to please come back to me. She said, But I'm here now. It's okay, darling. I pulled her in to hug and said, But you're not. You're gone. I miss you so much. She started like playing with my ponytail and said, It's okay, princess. I'm here now and I love you. That's when I woke up, and for another 30 seconds after waking up, I could smell her perfume. She died in a hospital and hadn't been in my room for over two months, so it couldn't have been anything on my bed or sheets or anything. Children see more paranormal than adults. It's because of the easy access to their brain. A little backstory. I had a pretty creative imagination back then, and my entire family remembers my best friend, Terry. He was imaginary. We did everything together, as many kids tend to create for themselves as well. I would talk to him out loud, and we quote-unquote played together outside for hours on end started off just in his imaginary friend, which I believe he came to maybe around five or six. By the time when I was turning about seven, Terry started to hang out less and less. I grew out of that phase of my life. But my mind wasn't done seeing imaginary things just yet. We lived in an old farmhouse built back in the 1870s, so I was always a little eerie, but things started to turn a little darker for me. The black silhouette of people started to show themselves to me. It began with just a few until I was seeing them almost like a few times a week. I kept it to myself at first until they kept coming and coming. It would even keep me up at night where I would just stare at my closet door until one night I saw the round door handle start to turn and the door ever so slightly creak open. I could see this happen because I started to sleep with the nightlight on as I began to develop a fear for the dark. After this, I started to tell my parents about the people I was seeing. They basically told me to brush it off. and I'm just imagining things. A few distinct sights I had was when I was sitting in the living room on the couch watching TV and before, a figure would show itself to me. I would get the sensation that someone was watching me, staring at me intensely that burning feel with a few shivers that might run down your spine, and you can't help but look around, you know? I would look out into the dining room and a figure would be looking at me, and then just walk off into the next room, disappearing. One time I was on the floor in the living room with some of my family and I had this sensation, so I looked out into the dining room for where I was sitting and didn't see anything. I started to look around left, then right, then I felt a warm sensation on the top of my head. I slowly look straight up and there's a figure kneeling on the couch directly over top of me, as if they're looking down at me like I was reading a book in my lap. I jumped up and it disappeared. Slowly the figures stopped showing themselves, and by middle school I hadn't seen any in years. It was my early high school and I was either a freshman or a sophomore when I was home alone out in the barn splitting wood. Dogs in the house, so I didn't have them running off. Splitter running pretty loud, headphones on blaring music. Then I get that old timey feeling that somebody's watching me, so I keep looking out the barn doors from the back of the barn. Nothing, nothing, nothing till I see a figure in the middle of the doorway with either an axe or a pitchfork resting on the ground. We stop and stare at each other for a few moments or moments, excuse me, till it turns to the right and dragging the tool just walks off the side of the barn. I throw my headphones down and run out the door to see if it was a person or what that I just saw. Nothing was there. No one was home. 
so I went back to splitting wood. I didn't have another experience until college when I started to experience sleep paralysis. It started off as normal and I would see myself in my dorm room laying in my bed and just have an eerie scared sensation that I was stuck. It seemed like someone was coming for me. I would try to yell over to my roommate sleeping next to me to wake me up, but of course couldn't yell, couldn't even move. This sucked, and it slowly started happening more and more until a figure would appear. It started off they would walk out of the bedroom door and just stop and stare at me, and I would wake up shortly after that. Then I had the worst one. The figure walked on over to me one night, got up on the top of my bed, and pinned me down with their knees on my chest and hands around my neck. They started to choke me out, and I was gasping for air, and I snapped awake, and my chest hurt like I had just been punched or fell down five stairs. I was gasping for air. My neck felt bruised, and I was immediately stiff afterwards. I was scared and thought I was getting attacked by a demon now. I started to see a friar on campus and stopped taking naps as it happened more frequently, at least when I napped till they slowly went away. Boring ending overall, but... I know. It's all right. What would you think? I live in my late mother-in-law's house with my husband, sister-in-law, and my brother-in-law. After the past 11 years, me and my husband being together, there have been varying uncertain things happening in and around the house. So I'll start from the beginning. Before my husband and I got together, a friend of his remarked as they were going down the driveway that they didn't want to go any farther because, quote unquote, demons were all over the yard. Another story I heard was my husband's ex-wife was asleep and my mother-in-law came into the room to wake her for church. But my mother-in-law wasn't even home at the time. Obviously, before she passed away, but... Okay, now onto the things that I've experienced firsthand. I have heard the voices of everyone inside of the house speaking or calling out to me or just talking in general. I've heard my husband calling out to me saying, Baby... Not like he was stressed or scared, but the tone was like he was trying to get my attention. When I didn't see him, I call him and he's next door at the neighbor's house. I have heard growling. My brother-in-law, who's a very logical man, saw a man in a top hat. And to this day, if you ask him about it, he'll deny it. My husband swears up and down he hears, just, just hears me just talking all the time. If you don't believe anything I've written here, this is the part you should believe. My husband and I were coming home and this black mass runs across our path. I swear to you, we should have hit it. And I to this day don't know what it was. And it still brings both of us chills. Whether it was a hellhound, whatever it was, I'm still unsure, but... It shot across the road. I saged my home and... It's the one of the most negative environments I've ever been in. From what I've researched about the land, there's no Indian burial grounds or traumatic events and no horrible deaths. So why it's there, I do not know. But I know something is within the walls of this house. Something happened that I can't explain. It's been about two months since this happened, and I still can't explain what happened. On Thanksgiving on my way home to my parents' house, they told me that my grandmother was rushed to the hospital overnight. They told me it didn't look so good, so I should stop in and see her. I went there and my cousins were leaving, so I would have some time before anybody else arrived. She was completely unresponsive. She was always very religious, and while I'm not, I decided to say a line of the rosary. As I was about two or three prayers in the room, it seemed to get darker like during an eclipse, and my rosary turned a bluish color. It also felt like someone's hands were on mine. When I finished, 
The sky seemed to open back up. I went outside the room after saying my goodbyes and I mentioned the darkness to someone. They asked what I was talking about. This was someone at the front desk so they would have seen it. And later that day my grandmother woke up and was fully responsive. She continued on for about another month before she just got too sick and all of her grandkids and children made a trip to see her in that last time. Haunted by something mischievous, but also giving. Unsure if this is paranormal or not, but I literally can't explain it. It's sort of silly, but it really has me confused. And paranormal happenings is the only thing I can think of. So, this past week I've been losing things that I set down somewhere very obvious. Like on my bed in a specific box on the counter. The most recent few experiences were when I was sleeving my text and 17 photo cards that I had like my baggie of card sleeves in the middle of my bed. And it was made, by the way. I got up to grab some washi tape and when I came back, the baggie of sleeves were gone. I looked all over my room under my bed, around the bed, in the sheets for almost an hour. Then I gave up. Went to fill up my water and when I came back, the sleeves were back on my bed. And I was all alone in my house. The next day I had put a small bundle of photo cards that my friend got into a box. I knew for a fact that I'd put them in there. When I forgot a card in her small bundle, I went to grab it and put it in there and it wasn't, no, it just wasn't there. Literally thought I was losing my mind and I looked all over. And I gave up, found a bundle of cards in a reusable grocery bag in my kitchen and I really thought shit was getting strange. Later that day I was leaving to meet my friend and like give them their box of stuff. Couldn't find my keys where I always put them. I'd gotten up from my bed before getting ready to leave and I knew nothing was on it. But guess where my keys were? On my bed. Today I had my purse in the passenger seat and it tipped over so I went to put the couple things that fell out back into and found it text free fall Kai photo card in between the seat and my center console. I had all the cards in the set, except that last Kai one, and I even tried trading for one trading event earlier that day but didn't get it. Then randomly it showed up for me. What's going on? Am I going nuts? The Things Dancing in the Field This happened to me and at the time my best friend in high school. We were in our senior year of high school at the time during the late 2000s and our mid-sized suburban school was holding an overnight lock-in. That's like a fun thing for the students to do. Both my friend and I were not super keen on the idea but some of the other guys from our class were going so we both reluctantly went. Our circle spent a good time on the lock-in playing a modified game of tag that we called Zombie. We had a good time, but as things were settling down around 1 a.m. or so, my friend and I both agreed that we didn't like spending the night at the school. My house was like a 20-minute walk from the school, so we both snuck out of the gym and started walking down the road connecting the high school and the middle school. It was toward my house. The sports fields were situated between the school and on the left side of the road was a sizable area of forest. As we continued walking down the barely lit road, I don't recall who actually noticed it at first, but it wasn't moments before we both stopped dead in our tracks in the middle of the road. Off to the left, about 25 feet from the edge of the woods, we both witnessed something to this day we can't really explain. In the field, there were somewhere between one and two dozen figures dancing in the field. I know that seems like a big difference between the low end and the high end of a guess, 1224, but you'll understand that difference by the time I'm done. These figures were all white. They looked like they were wearing like white hooded robes. They were dancing in an odd, 
almost playfully ritualistic way. That's the best I can decide they're circling in and out of each other. You might think we had run into another group of students having a weird lark in the field. But what we were looking at wasn't human. They had the vague shape of humans, but their movements were impossible for humans to make. It's like they were made of jello or some kind of amorphous kind of material. The bodies would almost seem to fold in on themselves, bending and only to really reform a similar shape of a hooded figure. The worst part was how during their odd dance some of them seemed to merge together, which made it very hard to get an accurate count of their number. I remember watching a hooded head bend forward toward the thing's stomach and bend up the other way like it had no spine or form. My friend and I stood dumbfounded in the road watching these creatures for like four or five minutes completely speechless. We only exchanged panicked looks at each other once during that time, as if to say, you're seeing what I'm seeing, right? After that time had passed, I felt like figures noticed us, or maybe they finished their odd dance moves, who knows. But they're all starting to move toward the woods. In a few seconds, the things were gone from our sight. We were left rather freaked out. It's at this point I should probably clarify that neither of us had anything to drink or any drugs and we were both dreadfully boring in high school too. We both, with fear in our hearts, started down the road again past those woods where those figures had disappeared into. We watched the woods with keen eyes, not sure what we'd do if these things came out again. But we didn't see them again. We continued on to my house, making damn good time with how fast we were walking. It's obviously been years since the encounter, but he and I still bring it up from time to time and we're both at a loss for what we inadvertently stumbled upon that night. Two hundred and fifty year old mill workers house. Okay guys, so around four months ago my wife and I moved into an old mill worker's house in the middle of the Scottish countryside. Ever since, we've been noticing some really strange activity. The first time was around three or four days after we moved in. I stumbled into the bathroom in the middle of the night to use the toilet. I noticed that the shower was running. Not a lot, but maybe one-tenth of the full capacity. A dribble, but enough that I noticed it. I turned it off, assumed it was the water pressure, or that I'd left it slightly open when I had a shower earlier. Went back to bed with no issues. This happened again a few times over the last few months. Always the same amount, with the same assumptions that I'd left it open. Until about three days ago. My wife and I were about to go to bed, and I was walking through the bathroom when I stopped dead in the hallway. The shower was running again but much, much louder, and with more power. I opened the door and the shower was on at maybe half or three quarters to full power. I very audibly just stopped in the door and said, What the fuck? My wife shouted, asking what had happened. I walked back through and explained to her, and she came out to look. Sure enough, the shower had been turned on and had actually been powerful enough to also soak the bathroom floor. It's a shower over bath combo with mixer tape. Ever since then, I did some investigating. I only recently learned how old the house is. I knew it was old when we moved in, but that's much more obvious. But I had no idea exactly how old. Turns out the house was built around 236 years ago. It wouldn't make sense with how many people have lived in the home in the years since it was built, but at least one person must have died whether from injuries sustained at the mill, old age, or things like smallpox. In the time since I've been investigating the history of our home in the area, things have gotten worse. As I was writing this post, I heard a massive bang from my living room. I initially thought it was one of the two cats, or perhaps them working together. But I went in and turned the light on immediately after. They're both asleep and looked very disgruntled that I woke them. I've been hearing what sounds like footsteps from our loft. 
although I've never been up there as the ceilings are quite high and I don't have a ladder right now. The other thing I've been noticing is a face in the bedroom window. The bedroom is first floor, so it can't be a person and we're in the middle of nowhere on a dead-end road, so it's not a car or streetlights. With the activity getting worse, I'm worried that it's going to start becoming more aggressive. I'm not sure from really what I'm going to do about that. I suppose I'll figure that out when the time comes. The Kentucky Holler Crawler When I was about 9 or 10 years old, my uncle told me a story that stuck with me ever since. Growing up in Kentucky, I've always heard tales of, you know, Bigfoot or the Pope Lick Goat Man, the usual run-of-the-mill urban legend campfire story. But in the case of the story my uncle had told me, it was different than all the other tales I'd heard before or since. Kentucky is home to the world's largest cave system in the world, Mammoth Cave. Since its founding in July 1st, 1941, only about 365 miles have been surveyed by the human eye. It's believed that there are still over 600 miles of passageways and caverns yet to be discovered. The National Park has stretched over three counties, spanning more than 50,000 acres. Edmondson, Hart, and Barron counties. My uncle owned land in Edmondson County since like the early 1980s. I remember hearing how about when they were out hunting for deer, they would occasionally come across pits in the ground of various sizes. They were the mouths of cave entrances. They would usually just toss a barrel or a large tree branch to the hole so no one would stumble across it, fall in or become trapped. Besides wildlife or just getting lost in the woods, there wasn't really much else you had to worry about, according to most people. This story takes place in the early 1990s, about five years after my uncle purchased the land. His closest neighbor, who I'm going to call Ken, lived about half a mile down that dirt road, and that road ran parallel to both of their properties. They naturally became good friends over time and on occasion would accompany each other hunting. My uncle lived in Louisville and would sit in his property when he had off days or needed to do upkeep like mowing or restocking his pond. So unlike his neighbor Ken, he spent more than most of the year in Louisville. On this particular weekend, Ken went out hunting for deer. He left his cabin and head off into the woods. He had done it a hundred times before. He followed a path that he had used plenty of times to a small grouping of trees overlooking a large meadow. According to him, it was like a perfect sunny fall day, with not many clouds in the sky. He sat in the shadows underneath some low-hanging tree branches, feeling hidden from any would-be prey that might come by. Despite it being the ideal weather for hunting, he didn't see much in terms of game, just a few fawn and a doe, not a big trophy buck he was hoping for. He had been entertaining the idea of just grabbing his gear and heading back to the cabin but not wanting to go home empty-handed. He decided to stick around for a little while longer in hopes his luck would change. His chest fluttered when he looked across the meadow to the left and saw movement in the tree line opposite of him. He pulled his knife to his shoulder and looked down the scope. The thick trees and foliage at the edge of the tree line prevented him from getting a good view of the animal in its sights. From what he could tell, it was heading toward the edge of the woods. He just had to be patient. When it stepped out of the shadow of the trees about 50 yards away and into the clearing, he knew almost immediately he wasn't looking at a deer. He tried to keep his hands from shaking, his rifle as he desperately tried to just identify what exactly it was that he was looking at. He described its body as that of a panther, but the upper torso where the shoulders and neck were sat noticeably higher than his lower back and hind legs. He was looking at its side profile, which he claimed while in mid-stride that this thing had to be close to seven feet in length. He said it was quiet like a cat, never made a noise when it moved. The front legs, he said, looked more like arms, 
significantly longer and skinnier than its hind legs. It had brittle, dark brown hair that started from the back of its head running down the length of its back, like a hyena. He also claimed that the creature's skin looked waxy, almost like a chimpanzee's skin, dark brown, almost black. Its face was long like a dog's, but he said he noticed no ears. He said the corners of its mouth ended by its neck, but the ears should be. The most unsettling detail I can remember of his account, though, was the, like, well, was the thing back legs. He described them as if looking like a frog, like the back legs were tucked up close to the creature's sides. When it walked, the leading leg would reach almost to the front half of its body, and the other leg would stretch way back flat like a frog when it crawls. He watched it for about two or three minutes, slowly and quietly moving through the long golden grass. A black shadow surrounded by color. He watched it disappear into the tree line directly across from the woods that he'd seen it come from initially. After a few months, he left and, or excuse me, after a few moments, he left and headed back to his cabin. Now, I don't know how long it was after this incident occurred that Ken told my uncle about it, but he was reluctant to speak about it at all. He dubbed it the Kentucky Holler Crawler. Eventually, Ken explained the story in full one night while sat around a fire with my uncle. Ever since then, Ken refused to go into the woods. He claimed to only hunt from the dirt road running through his property afterward. Both my uncle and Ken have sadly passed away since, but their stories never changed over the years. I even had my uncle retell the story to me a few years back, just so I knew I had all the details right. Maybe this was just another tall tale used to scare me and my brother when we were kids. Can't be on my uncle's land, but I know one thing for sure. He was an honest man, and his eyes told the truth when he would tell me that story. He had his fair share of unexplainable instances as well, but I'm sure anybody would be after frequenting a cabin in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, for over 30 years. The thing that keeps me up at night, though, isn't the thought of the creature. It's the thought of where it came from. Who's to say this thing didn't crawl up from the cave, spanning hundreds of miles in every direction, hidden from civilization, thriving off the ecosystem? Nothing is impossible when it comes to nature. Nobody really knows for sure what's out there in the dark. A Thanksgiving Night to Remember When I was 16, my parents, sister, and I drove five hours to my uncle and aunt's about the day before Thanksgiving. My uncle and aunt set the entire family up to sleep in their upstairs guest room. They had a bunk bed, an air mattress, a futon, and a twin bed. They warned us the room gets very hot, especially when a lot of people sleep in it. I shared the futon with my mom and fell asleep with a sheet and a blanket without issue. In the middle of the night, I woke up laying on my back, very hot under the covers. I immediately removed them and turned to my left to go back to sleep. I felt my mom put her hand on my right side, just above my waist, and was annoyed because it was hot and she was making it worse. I reached my right arm over to move her arm, felt the empty futon bed beside me instead. I looked, and I was alone on the futon. Immediately, I had goosebumps all over. My mom had moved to the floor to cool off and was nowhere near to touch me. I woke her and begged her to come back to the futon. She returned and I put the blanket back on regardless of how hot it was. I did not want another unwelcome cuddle from who knows what. The next day, my uncle and aunt mentioned that the others had had experiences in that room. Voices and touches, but they didn't want to scare us beforehand. That surely was a Thanksgiving to remember. My dad visits me in my dreams. On May 6th, 2023, my father was found dead in his car. 
He had been in the car for four days until police found him. His cause of death was suicide. After the service for him and my family had been in a pretty depressing state. I'd always been a daddy's girl when I was young and his death destroyed me. Three days after the service, I remember the night he first appeared in my dreams. It started like any other of my normal dreams, colors, cartoons, wacky physics, etc. Then after a while everything cut to white. It was quiet, not in an eerie way, but more of a calming light. After the peaceful light, I'm at my grandma's back porch where she had her pool. We go to my grandparents' house every family holiday or in the summer. It was empty and I was staring at the bright blue pool and it felt like summer. The trees were lush green and it was bright outside. It felt oddly real. It felt so real that I could feel the warm summer sun and light breeze. It was quiet for a few moments until I kind of heard, like, the sound of a can opening. I turned to look around and see my dad in a lounge chair, Bud Light in his hand. He looked healthier like he used to look back in 2020. My father, before he died, had a critical case of diabetes and made him unhealthily skinny. He was wearing his favorite pair of shades and his black sleeveless top and bathing shorts. He drunk from his beer and pulled up a chair beside him and just invited me to sit with him. His eyes were watering and I sat down beside my dad. I could hear the distant sounds of birds and my dad's breathing and his occasional sipping of his Bud Light. It felt calm. After a while of sitting there with him, he turned to look at me, he gave me a warm smile and gave like a soft chuckle telling me that it'd be all right. I remember him saying to me, I'm all right, it's peaceful here. I remember his hand just gently rubbing my back. It felt real too. He used to rub my back when I was like upset or tired. Couldn't stop my tears from falling. My breath caught in my throat as I could choke out a word. He wrapped his big arms around me, giving me a big hug. His hand rubbing my back, still telling me that he loved me. After he told me he loved me, I woke up with my eyes watering. It was strange, but it comforted me. Maybe it was his way of saying his final goodbye. Ever since, I've never had another dream about him. I still remember what she looked like. I remember it all. It was 1998. I was eight years old and visiting my dad's childhood home. The town where he grew up in was so small that you could drive through it within 10 minutes. I still remember the smell of steak from the mom and pop owned restaurant, the sweet cookies from the bakery, and even the cigarette smoke from the hair salon that my grandma used to run out of her basement from 15 years earlier. The house had to have been built in the early 1900s. The floors creaked and there were vines all over the front of the house that my dad wanted to rid of, but my grandma liked the way that they looked. It gave her privacy, she said. My brother slept in my dad's old room, which was primarily blue. I remember the Chicago sports team posters on the wall and the edges torn and frayed from time and the occasional water damage. Out of the two remaining rooms, I chose my grandmother's linen room and my parents took a spare room downstairs. I remember the room being frilly. White frilly curtains matched the white lace comforter on the bed. Her sewing machine in the far right corner, in front of the window where she would watch my dad play in the backyard. My dad playfully whispered, That's the haunted room. My dad was kind of a jokester and I remember sort of scrunching my nose at him and put my suitcase on the floor in front of the bed. Little did I know, he wasn't kidding. That night I remember falling asleep easily. My biggest worry is that I'd wake up in a puddle for my four-year-old sister who shared a bed with me. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking around. Everything was dark except for the dim light that came from the bathroom down the hallway. The shadows from the sewing machines hit the wall and looked like box cars. I turned over to face the left side of my room and that's when I saw her. At first I thought it was my mom. The silhouette of a woman was standing in the doorway of the room. She was wearing a white dress. And my mom didn't wear dresses, not even a nightgown. She had long, fine hair and my mom had the typical fluffy 90s do. 
was like down to her shoulders. I quickly realized this wasn't my mom and panic set in. She was all white, skin, hair, dress, everything. I remember she had a subtle glow about her. She was leaning on the door frame, watching us sleep. Her head was tilted to the side, resting in her right hand that was being supported by her elbow against the frame. I wasn't scared, but she was terrifying, but comforting at the same time. It was like she was watching her own children sleeping. Lovingly. I remember closing my eyes and praying she wouldn't come near me. She never did. The next morning I went to the kitchen where my grandma was already awake making us breakfast. Waffles with several different syrups and a huge bowl of assorted fruit. I didn't talk or eat much for the majority of breakfast and my dad definitely took notice. After a few minutes of coaxing, I finally kind of told him what I saw. He immediately looked at my grandma and said, Ha! I told you. Ha! I told you it's the end of the stories. See you later.